All right, so I have 20 minutes to try and cover something like 15 papers, so it's not going to happen. And instead, I'm just going to highlight the key and new, novel, relevant changes from the last consensus into this 2019 consensus. So again, a conflict of interest. I, I, my research is sponsored by various um, folks, but my major conflict of interest is having athletes perform better within the rules of sport. So 16 papers, one position stand, and one consensus paper. Uh, I, I'm indebted to the 53 authors that helped participate in this. Uh, a bunch of them are here across 12 countries. Uh, this is now published as of last month in um, IJS uh, NEM. It's open access, folks. Please download. Even if you're not into nutrition, it will really help show the journal that making things open access is worthwhile. Have your kids download it. Have grandma download it. Just, just download it. And I will attempt to capture these key and novel themes since the last consensus without avoiding repetition uh, with things that have happened uh, previously in the conference and from what you'll see from Andy. I do want to emphasize the obvious, eating the natural way. Um, I'm a through and through athletics guy. Uh, my wife was competing at the Brussels Diamond League about 2010. And here's a photo of one of our Canadian 10,000 meter runners, two time Olympian, with uh, Kenanisa Bekele, the uh, double um, world record holder, uh, four Olympic golds. And it wasn't until I got home and I looked at the plates here. These are all foods that uh, your great grandmother would recognize as food. This is an excellent photo that I always show the young kids uh, when starting off my presentation. So food first, absolutely with our consensus statements. There's been a whole series um, um, uh, of consensus statements. I hope to highlight the unique and numerous performance aspects of athletic. I'll focus on the published nutrition since the last consensus. And then the last consensus also featured, um, and this next consensus will also feature uh, athlete and coach education outputs um, and some different infographics. So very quickly, uh, like literally a couple of slides, um, I'm going to cover a bit of what is athletics, the ergogenic aid outcome, nutrition for injury illness, leading into energy availability, and then, and then a summary. So what is athletics? Uh, all of you know it's 22 individual events. There's a new mixed relay. We're talking about 144 medals across the spec a spectrum of explosive strength and speed all the way to endurance. So my last, um, uh, obviously, you, and then you have your sub-event groups, sorry. Throws, sprint hurdles, jumps, combined events, middle and long distance. And really, when you look at performance de determinants, of which psychology is really important. On one side, you have more structural and mechanical determinants. And the other side, you have your bioenergetics or physiological determinant. I really want to emphasize that I think there's an overemphasis at times in our coach education. And for us as physiologists, that everything is a, a physiological and energy determinant constraint. Uh, biomechanics and structural determinants are incredibly important as well. And as someone who works in nutrition, it's important to appreciate um, that. I had this slide in my last talk. Again, here's your event group. More physiologically determinant, more mechanically determinant. Uh, this is in one of the papers in terms of the physiological and structural factors associated with these key determinants, and then where nutrition can play a role across. I showed this in my last talk. Obviously, there's also event-specific optimized physique and high power to um, weight ratio. So again, running force comparisons, it's really important to recognize that there's three or four times your body weight of force while sprinting. In the triple jump, it's, it's been in, in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 times your body weight force. So there are a lot of structural determinants that are important to appreciate uh, as nutritionists, as physiologists. Um, and beyond that, um, obviously, it also infects endurance sport. Andy may touch on this a little bit, but um, the biomechanical um, uh, advantages of this shoe um, also play a significant role in marathoning. I think our appreciation of nutrition and biomechanics is 
really poor and something that needs to be addressed more in the future. And I think Andy will have a little bit on that um, in his talk coming up. So er ergogenic aids for athletics. Um, there was an IOC consensus statement on uh, ergogenic aids in 2018. Um, we also used the same decision matrix for, I or sorry, for IFF cons uh, consensus. And it's a common sense approach. If it works, make sure you have a clean source. Most things don't work. And if it works really well, it's probably banned. So you can read through all this, but most importantly, make sure it's third party tested. Make sure there's some evidence behind it. And I do think good policies, we have a national supplement policy can go a long way in finding the risk and reward balance here. I have some physicians, some organizations that say no to all supplement. And that's really hard when you, you have an anemic 16 year old female girl because an iron supplement, vitamin D is a supplement. So those are health supplements. So I think we need a, a little more appreciation of the risk reward in this space. There's the big five that have been highlighted by the IOC and um, Pete Peeling and uh, his group uh, did a great job of highlighting the event groups where these supplements might work or might not work. To be honest, there's not always evidence in all of these event groups and some of these check marks are extrapolated from existing um, evidence in other sport. It's important to realize though if I take meta-analysis for each of these supplements, you can look at a two to 3% increase in performance. Obviously, your elite athlete is not gonna have an 18% increase in performance. And supplement combination studies are also um, incredibly rare. And so, very a, a few meta-analysis have now looked in at effect sizes. So for bi sodium bicarb, for example, the effect size for bicarb for untrained is, is moderate at 0 0.6, and it's actually quite small untrained. And that should make good sense, given the sigmoidal adaptation curve in the athletes that many of us work, work in, their headroom for improvement is much smaller and or non-existent. Um, the nitrates, for example, seem to work a lot less, if not at all, if your VO2 max is over about 65. Most of your studies are done in average university males in this part of the curve. So nutrition for injury illness. Um, the likelihood of achieving a performance goal decreased seven times in those that completed less than 80% of training. That was highlighted yesterday. Participants in endurance events were tenfold more likely to suffer an in-championship illness. Um, work, uh, work from Juan Manuel here. Uh, and athletes reporting a pre-participation illness complained anxiety were more likely to sustain an illness. Female athletes were nine times more likely of an illness at a major championship. Low energy availability was seven times more likely. So I see nutrition, I see nutrition, I see anxiety. And what's interesting, at least in Canada until recently, this was a very rare sighting at the Olympics, two nutrition experts together. I know there's a lot of physicians in the room, but a lot of times, and I know accreditations are short, but a lot of times it's nutrition and psychology that, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have an accred for you, but this data here would suggest, in fact, it may be a game changer. I'll get off my soapbox. There are um, a few areas in nutrition. This is a good consensus uh, in 2010 on immunonutrition and exercise, and I can summarize it with another big five. You can optimize and minimize, optimize health and minimize illness by adequate, adequate, sorry, adequate energy, adequate carbohydrate, sleep, intelligent training load application, and personal hygiene. Just, just focus on the big five there, and and you'll be doing an excellent job. One area that's emerged a lot since the last um, consensus is red, uh, uh, relative energy deficiency in sport. And I was lucky to pen a, a recent editorial uh, saying it's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, female athlete triad is the top of the iceberg and red, probably this large piece under the iceberg. Um, 
with the idea that REDS not only uh, impacts health parameters, and here's your female athlete triad, but also performance parameters. I should stress that um, a lot of this still requires a lot of research. It's a conceptual model, and it's a model that is yet to be definitively validated uh, in terms of scoring. There's a lot of work to do in this space. But REDS affects sports medicine, nutrition, physiology, mental performance, s and and there was just a paper on um, uh, biomechanic and, and red. Uh, we all know that female runners are at high risk for stress fractures, um, uh, but Jen Saigo in Toronto recently uh, showed that low energy availability was also in elite female sprinters. We also know that it's in male endurance athletes. And so it's not just female runners that are at risk, and here's a newspaper article from Colin Jackson, again, Athletics. Looking back, of course, knowing the things I now know about nutrition and diet, there's no way I would have done it. I could have probably gone faster in terms of his absolute extreme dieting um, that he was involved with during his career. So again, with track and field, I was lucky to have a great grad student that I shared with um, uh, a whole host of, of folks, including Louise Burke. Uh, we've done a whole bunch of research up at Flagstaff, and we had um, 59 athletes in 2016 from across six countries. 27% went on to be Olympians. Where we looked at energy availability, we split the males and females as either amenorrheic or eumenorrheic, low testosterone or normal. No, low testosterone is the lowest quartile. So some of these were still in the clinically normal range but the low testosterone values here were um, under 14.5 nanomole. As been shown before, amenorrheic females, so disrupted menstrual cycle, does result in bone mineral density losses and significant difference. It seems to be a bit more of a protective effect with testosterone. However, when it came to injuries, red is two or more stress fractures, black is one stress fracture, and white is no stress fractures. So what you can see is amenorrheic and low testosterone had significantly more um, stress fractures. And in fact, uh, there was a five and a half times more likely incidence of stress fracture in amenorrheic females and, male, and males with testosterone uh, 15 or lower. What was also interesting is baseline hemoglobin mass was 8% lower or 8% more lower in our amenorrheic females. So these females are spending thousands of dollars to look for a 3 to 4% increase in hemoglobin mass at an altitude camp, but they're showing up 8% lower, and if they just consume more calories consistently coming into camp, they would already get an 8% gain in hemoglobin. Pretty important finding as well. Our changes in the altitude camp for hemoglobin um, did not appear to be impacted by energy, indicators of energy availability or the sex hormone. But again, it's just three weeks, and red blood cells have a long uh, lifespan, and so maybe we weren't that surprised. So in summary, um, I had some key summary points here. I hope I've impressed upon you that athletics is indeed one of the most diverse sports in the world impressive neuromuscular demands, and thus require event and individual specificity requiring nutrition advice. And since 2007, the novel nutrition interventions that are highlighted throughout this consensus statement include a much further appreciation of nutrition and injury and illness, as I presented, the development of REDS as a concept from the triad as in injury illness prevention, Periodization of nutrition with periodized training. That was my lecture this morning. I covered that already. Further uh, evidence and establishment of the big five ergogenic aids that I, that I had up there. Um, as mentioned by Daniel, advances in the impact that gluten or lack of gluten or full gluten and FODMAPs might have on athlete GI symptoms. I didn't have time to show that, but um, uh, I had a PhD student that unpacked gluten and if you're not a celiac, we found no effects on performance and no effects on uh, gastrointestinal. There does seem to be more emerging evidence to suggest FODMAP reduction for a few days leading into a key endurance event. 
in people who are susceptible to GI problems might be an intervention you would consider. I would never consider FODMAPs chronically. It's, it's too much dietary restriction. Um, Andy will present some advances in fueling and hydration uh, in his talk coming up. And then finally, um, I would say that there's uh, increased knowledge and appreciation of in interventions, uh, nutrition interventions as well, like slurries and ice, um, ice slurries to attenuate heat stress and heat adaptation, um, menthol, for example. Those have been presented throughout the conference. So finally, the uh, leadership team that kind of led this co uh, entire consensus, uh, which was a slug of work, uh, is everyone up there. Um, I'm indebted to all of them and their expertise and their input as well. And so that's it for me, and I believe I'll hand over to Andy, and we'll have uh, questions at the end. Thank you.